CFL Combine one-on-one -on -one with CFL Commissioner Randy Ambrosi. You've been really busy all over the country. I think you went Montreal, Winnipeg, Edmonton, and who knows where in between. What's this last little bit been like for you, especially with the sale of the Montreal Alouettes, and how did it come together so quickly with Pierre Carl Pelado? Uh, well, to be honest, it was a bit stressful, uh, you know, when um, – when the former owners advised us that uh, you know they wanted to go in a different direction, you know, I, I, you know, we, we were obviously disappointed, uh, but you know, we we talked it through with them, so we had to kind of work through that part of the process. Uh, the decision was made; it was in our best interest to take uh, to take ownership of the team, handle the sale process ourselves, and in part, Justin, the reason why we believe that was the right thing to do is was we've been doing so much work. Over the past 12 to 18 months, we put together a committee of the board on ownership transition uh, and expansion. It was really designed to, to a, we hired an investment banking partner to really help guide us to prepare a lot of materials to help explain the CFL. You think it's easy to, it's an easy story to tell, but it's actually quite complicated. And there's a lot of things that have changed in the last five years that we're very proud of. You know, having uh, the revenue sharing plan. Uh, the long-term uh, CBA with the players was a real feature. Uh, the non-player football cap, the fact that we have a cost control strategy within the league, these are really positive developments, the genius partnership. So they had done all that work. So it was so good because in that moment, we knew we were about 85 to 90% ready to go. And of course, we had built this relationship with, uh, with our investment banking group. And, uh, and we had a lot of confidence in, in their ability to help us. So it was a very different moment than that moment back in 2019. And then when we opened the doors to you know, the groups who express interest, we had a data room. We had a data room up and running within, within a matter of days. We invited the groups that were expressing interest in, of course, signing of non-disclosure documents and all those, all those things. But one of the things that I'll, I'll, I'll always remember is the first phone call I, I had with, uh, with Pierre Carl Palado. And, you know, he was such a gentleman. And he said, you know, Randy, just so you know, we're, like he said, we and my, my partners and I are, are, are so serious about doing this. And we just started talking about the Alouettes and the history of the Alouettes and his own experience as a, young, as a youngster growing up in Montreal. And I could feel the, his excitement. It, in some ways, it reminded me of talking to Amar Doman about BC and the BC lines, the way Amar just is so effusive in his, in his passion for it. And I heard that same thing with Pierre Carl. So of course, at that point, we still had groups, other groups in the process. We were committed to running a good process. And again, we, we hired a banking partner to, to help manage that for us. And then, um, and then we had, you know, we had a request for a for a for an exclusive uh, arrangement, uh, which which is not uncommon in corporate transactions. Um, we advised the other groups that that you know that that was that we needed to we needed them to move quickly if you know if they wanted an opportunity to participate. But the one best thing of all of it was just how incredibly professional, positive, and, and forward-looking Pierre Carl and his guys were. Uh, they made it clear from day one, so we said, you know, there, was a, there were some guiding principles. One, we wanted to move fast. They teased us. We said we wanted to move fast, and they said, we'll move faster than you can move. And that was kind of a, that was a really interesting point to the, that they made. And we said we wanted a win-win arrangement. We wanted, we wanted the successful buyer to walk into their very first governor's meeting, head held high as a true partner to the other teams. And boy, they honored that and then some because they were so committed to the idea of a, of a fair transaction. Um, you know, there are some complexities and there were issues that needed to be sorted out, but in every way, uh, Pierre Carl's negotiating team were so positive, so professional, and they wanted to honor that win-win spirit. So. You know, I went from a little bit of dismay and a little bit of stress, uh, you know, at that first moment. And that Friday when we were able to make the announcement, pure joy. Just sitting next to him and feeling his emotion, seeing his two little boys wearing their Alouettes jerseys and how excited he was to see them wearing, that was, that was a really great day. How did it come to be that Pelado was the owner in the sense that I think a lot of people feel like well, why didn't you get him the first time around? And I want to give you the chance to explain, was he even interested the first time around when Sid Spiegel and Gary Stern purchased the team? Because I think a lot of people have said, well, Sid Spiegel was getting up there in age. But 
I don't get the sense that Pelado was interested the first time around. Was that the case? No, we you know we didn't we didn't talk to uh, Pierre Carl in that first round. But you know it's probably not a bad point to just make the point. Uh, look, I think we are so lucky and so fortunate and based on a lot of hard work and good planning to have a, an owner that lives in Montreal that's a Quebecer, that's a Montrealer, and his roots run so deep. He's a billionaire. And he's, and he's, uh, and he's done well for himself, is, what I'll, is how I'll say it. He's done real well for himself. We're so lucky to have that. But you know, if not for, if not for Gary Stern and Sid Spiegel, maybe we don't get to this. Maybe we weren't so lucky to have, uh, we were very lucky in my opinion, to have Sid and Gary step in when they did. And frankly, they carried a lot of water up the hill during 2020, which was a very difficult year, not just in the CFL, but in the world of sports. 21 was coming, you know, coming still in COVID, coming through COVID. I think we owe that. We owe the respect to, to Sid Spiegel's memory uh, and to Gary Stern to say thank you that they got us through that tough period and they allowed us to get to the PKP era, Pierre Carl Palado, and, and how excited we are to have him as a partner. So I'll always feel a sense of gratitude. So Pierre Carl wasn't there in 2020, 2019, but he's here now and maybe just through the good graces of that, of that intervening time, we have such a strong owner with a long-term vision for the Alouettes. You could argue that maybe when Sid Spiegel and Gary Stern bought the team, that was the worst possible timing because it was just before the pandemic. But I think you could also make an argument now that the CFL might be in its best place that's ever been in terms of stable ownership across the board. Now, you're looking to expand that into the Maritimes. I know you're really excited about it, and it seems like Mayor Mike Savage out there in Halifax has changed his tune a little bit. It sounds like it's more the tune of 2019. How confident are you in getting an ownership group together for a potential team out there? And I say that with the backdrop of Schooner Sports and Entertainment and What's going on with them, and how could you get an ownership group yeah. together? Well, probably the most important moment in this uh, in this journey, or one of the most important moments, was really spending time in that community, which we've done, meeting with some meeting with some of the key stakeholders and uh, and real centers of influence, including Mayor Savage. I met with uh, Premier Houston back in uh, back at a, uh, informally at a Christmas party. Just said hello to him. But what we've done is a lot of listening. And one of the things that we've heard is, look, come at this in an Atlantic Canadian way. Think about the market finding a solution to this stadium rather than the CFL, you know, defining a, um, you know, its need for this, for this uh, stadium. And one of, the, one of the things that came out of that is, hey, perhaps what Atlanta Canada can start with is what we've been describing as temporary permanent an expanded stadium based on the way we do our touchdown Atlantic games now and the way some of our we do some of our great cups where we bring in we bring in bleacher seating it expands the stadium and we started having this conversation and the more we had it the more energy those key centers of influence the more energy they were bringing to the conversation about that could be a real solution it's got economy to it it can be done fairly quickly so that was really, I think, the, that was a really important moment in this process. Where we are now is uh, we have been talking to people who are genuinely interested in having the conversation with us, but that happened because temporary permanent looks like it's a viable way to approach the expansion of a, into another market. But on our side, on the CFL side, I think we all know that we just can't keep talking about this because at some point fatigue sets in. And we believe that expansion to 10 teams is really a critical next step for this league's future. But we also have to, we also have to say, you can't just keep talking, you have to take action. So the next several months will be critical and our plan is to go into Atlanta, Canada in a very positive, very forthright way. We're gonna define what expansion looks like. We've made a commitment to our board. We'll define what expansion will look like. We'll make those. We'll make that case for what expansion needs to look like to potential ownership groups, and then we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to say just like we did in Montreal. Like, you know, was this somebody put up their hand and like Pierre Carl did and say, okay, what we want it to be us. Hopefully, with the same level of enthusiasm and the same commitment to a win-win arrangement. So, we're there, but we're not. We're not exclusively containing our our, our energy to that market. Look, I, I want to go. I saw, I saw um, Mr. Tangay of the Rouge et Or at the Vanier Cup, and I, I, I'm just such a big fan of what he's built 
And I, I think I invited myself, uh, Mr. Tangay may, may have a different recollection, but I invited myself to come see him in Quebec City. We should, go, we should go have a conversation in Quebec City. And now, of course, we get to talk to Pierre Carl Palado, who knows the province, who knows he's, you know, he's very well tied in. We get to talk to him about it as well. We're looking forward to that. Bottom line is uh, there's a lot of energy within the league. The, the benefits that would come with expansion, um, that 10th team, uh, changes our scheduling. Instead of having to play 18 games in 21 weeks, we could play 18 games in 19 weeks. That means Grey Cup isn't the third week of November, it's the end of the first week of November. It means your playoff games are in October, and it means more of our games are played in the summer season, which is really good for the CFL and CFL fans, and it's the feedback they've been giving us. So we got a lot of energy now, but we're gonna work with our governors to make sure we're clear and precise on what expansion will look like, and then we're going to take that to the market. And I believe you told me at the winter meetings that revenue for CFL games in the summer are actually higher. They are. And just one last one on expansion. Would there be a possibility that the CFL and or its teams would own that franchise to get it going and show that it can be viable? Or what are your thoughts Yeah, on you know, I, 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 if, if I was asked by my governors, to, I, would, I would tell them not to do that. Because I, and I'd say that because when you see what happens in a market with local leadership and local energy, and you see what Amar has done, you see what's, got, you know, we Calgary, uh, the community teams, what, you know, Saskatchewan owned by the people of Saskatchewan, Winnipeg owned by the people of, of, of Winnipeg and of Manitoba. You, you see what Bob Young and Scott Mitchell have, have done in Hamilton where you got that local person uh, what John Rud Ruddy and Roger Greenberg have done, they, they're kind of, they're in the market. And I'd say that's what, that is the foundation of a great franchise is somebody, some group of people who are in that market, who believe passionately in their market, who want to give back to the community because a big part of our value proposition is our connection and commitment to the community. So if the governors asked me, I'd say I wouldn't suggest that's the right path. Let's go find somebody show them why this is the right thing to do and it's the right time to do it and get them committed. Just so we know, where does it stand with Schooner Sports and Entertainment? Are they stepping back from that idea of having a team in Halifax? Yeah, you know, we, we basically put that conversation with them. I, I have, uh, you know, Gary Drummond and his partners, I have nothing but uh, the greatest respect for, but we, we kind of agreed that, look, that, that part of the that part of this process was probably time to just put that on hold for now. And, uh, you know, we said to them that we were going to be out there talking to other groups and, they, and they've been perfectly comfortable with that. Thanks for your time and we're kind of making this a regular thing. I hope you're okay with it. I like it very much. Appreciate it. Thanks.